welcome everybody this evening as we gather. I, I'd just like to begin um, by saying that during our, discern our journey of discernment during our lockdown and at our assembly, the issue of our LGBTQ sisters and brothers in the church was an area that many felt required a dedicated conversation. Tonight, we will have that conversation. We'll have an informal discussion and theological exploration about the experience of being a member of the LGBTI community in the church today. But before we do that, let us, as is our custom, begin with a moment of prayer. During this month of November, in which we especially remember our deceased relatives and friends, let us remember those of God's children who were lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, queer, and who were denied by church and state the opportunity to be all that God wanted them to be. We remember those of God's children who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, queer, and who, despite persecution, ridicule, and discrimination, remain faithful to, the living, to living the gospel in all they say and do. We pray that we may be truly open to those of God's children who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, queer, and that God's spirit will help us to see and heal any prejudice or blindness in our hearts and mind, and help us to stand in solidarity with them. We pray that God's children who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, queer, may exercise the fullness of their gifts within this community called church. For without their full participation, the body of Christ is not truly authentic. And as we pray a prayer to the Holy Spirit by Dermot O'Murphy, let us pray that individually and collectively, we will be filled with the utter fullness of the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, breathe down upon our troubled world. Shake the tired foundations of our crumbling institutions. Break the rules that keep you out of all our sacred spaces. And from the dust and rubble, gather up the seedlings of a new creation. Come Holy Spirit, inflame once more the dying embers of our weariness. Shake us of our complacency, whisper our names once more and scatter your gifts of grace with wild abandon. Break open the prisons of our inner being and let your raging justice be our sign of liberty. Come, Holy Spirit, and lead us to places we would rather not go. Expand the horizons of our limited imaginations. Awaken in our souls dangerous dreams for a new tomorrow, and rekindle in our hearts the fire of prophetic enthusiasm. Come, Holy Spirit, whose justice outwits international conspiracy, whose light outshines spiritual bigotry, whose peace can overcome the destructive potential of warfare, whose promise invigorates our every effort to create a new heaven and a new earth, now and forever. Empowered by the Spirit, we continue the mission entrusted to us. Come, Holy Spirit, come.
And so it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Father James Allison this evening. He's a Catholic theologian, priest, and prolific author. He's noted for his application of the great French thinker René Girard's anthropological theory to Christian systematic theology and for his work on LGBTQ issues. His own faith journey has overcome many hurdles, including a lengthy process of being treated a bit like the ball in a pinball machine when he was suspended by church authorities from active ministry in part over his LGBTQ affirming work. His quiet insistence that being gay is simply a non-pathological minority variant in the human condition was vindicated in a way nobody could have imagined when he received a phone call from Pope Francis himself in July, 2017. The Holy Father said to him, I want you to walk with deep interior freedom following the spirit of Jesus and I give you the power of the keys. It's only a fortnight since the press was alight following the release of the documentary Francesco when the Pope spoke of his support for same-sex civil unions it, and at the time Father James Martin who joined us at the very beginning of our journey of discernment said in the press it feels like a major step forward in the church's support of LGBTQ people. And here this evening, James will address and reflect about the experience of being a member of the LGBTQ community in the church today, and as many of the issues surrounding it as we have time for tonight. So without further ado, James, welcome this evening, and I'm delighted to hand over to you. Well, thank you very, very much for having me. Uh, am I now audible, visible, and all the things I should be? You are. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very, very much for having me. And um, I, I recently watched the, the YouTube you had with Tina Beatty. And so uh, I know that one of the things I should do is to, uh, to confess to Scottish ancestry, as she did. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I would like to say that uh, from on my, my father's side, both of his parents, so both my paternal grandparents were, were of Scottish origin, one from the Roses of Kilroch and the other, the Allisons, um, who were Covenanters and are buried at Strathaven Cemetery. Uh, that much I know about uh, them. I don't think that my parents, my, my grandparents ever met in Scotland. I think that they are products of the uh, British colonial diaspora in Australia and Malaysia and India, uh, rather than rather than Scotland, but there we are. Um, uh, there's, there's, uh, there's, there's Scottish blood in these veins somewhere. So thank you very, very much indeed for, for, for having me. Um, and uh, you've asked me to begin to share some of the issues uh, to do with um, I suppose, being gay and the gift of faith. And what I'd like to do is to say that um, one of the most difficult things for any of us to, uh, to get in life is approval. Um, one of the things that that simply comes along if you are L, G, B, or T, is you discover that you don't have approval. Um, in other words, issues of shame are incredibly powerful as you begin to discover who you are and that you might not be who you're supposed to be. And who is to tell you who you should be? Um, that is that's something incredibly powerful in all of our lives when we're growing up. And of course, one of the, the difficult things uh, about it is that if you are L, G, B, or T, um, very often, and at least until recently, most of the voices 
who on whom you depend for approval are voices that say to you the equivalent of be anything except who you actually are. One of the quickest things you learn is whatever you are, you are not that. I, I'm reminded of the story of a, told me by a, a, a young friend from Chile um, who, when he was uh, growing up, there was a very popular television series by a very camp uh, artist called Rafaela Carra. And she had very uh, tight panted sequined dancers, ballerinos who were obviously very, very camp indeed. And um, this friend of mine in Chile learned, uh, discovered that he was gay when he was asked by his uh, family when he was a, a small child, what is it that you want to be when you grow up? And he said, when I grow up, I want to be one of the dancers of Rafaela Carras show. <laughs> and they said, oh no, actually you want to be just about anything but one of the dancers. <laughs> so uh, in other words, you don't want to be what you are. I want to say that this is, if you like, what is for me the center of the issue, if you like, for LGBT people and the church, because for far too long, uh, church leaders and our parents and the state laws uh, have said to us, you are not that thing. And if you are, it is something deeply shameful and disgusting, really. And uh, at least do, do us the favor of hiding it away. And many of us grow up, frankly, uh, terrified of hell from the moment we realize who we are. Um, it's a very common, it's a very common experience. I think it's probably more common, at least in, to judge by conversations I've had amongst people brought up in the Protestant world than in the Catholic world, the threat of hell and the drastically binary nature of good and evil uh, is much stronger in the Protestant world than it is in the Catholic world, thank heavens. But even so, the threat of hell, um, the sense that you are, you are a terrible mistake uh, and that you will never get approval is, is incredibly strong. And I want to say that I think that this for me uh, is what's so important uh, for us. What I think has been happening over the last 30, 40, 50 years is that little by little, LGBT people have been finding that we are approved, not by other human beings, but by God. We are actually finding ourselves able to say, yes, I am. And not only in the uh, how would I say, you know, the, the confessing with the terrible fear. Yes, I am. Oh my God, what am I going to do about it? Which is a phase some of us uh, go through. But a sense of relaxing into the notion that, yes, this is who I am becoming. This is how I am to be a son of God, a daughter of God. And that I needn't be frightened of this. Living this out is going to be my becoming. My entering into the kingdom. And for me, that's really what this is about. I'm, I, it, it seems weird to, to say this, but I'm really quite a conservative Catholic theologian. Um, I'm not interested in special pleading uh, for gay and lesbian people to have us introduced sideways into the church as some kind of special, oh, well, we'll be nice to the queers as long as they behave more or less decently. Um, I think that the gospel is too important for that. I think that the gospel is to do with discovering that we are called into being as sons and daughters of God for whom 
there are no second class citizens. And this, if you like, uh, seems to me to be uh, where we are at the moment. As we are discovering ourselves first class citizens, and there's something very similar here to what Tina was talking about, about the relation, the iniquitous relationship between church authority and women. Uh, there's something uh, iniquitous here as well. Uh, church authority has to gaslight us in order to survive. It has to tell us we're something we aren't in order to be able to keep its own doctrine pure. And what we're discovering is that it isn't so. According to the official doctrine, we're not really gay or lesbian people. We're really intrinsically heterosexual people who suffer from some form of disorder or vice by which we suffer from so-called same-sex attraction. And uh, only if we accept that and do our very best to mitigate uh, this uh, disorder from which we suffer, will we have access to the kingdom. In other words, be good second-class citizens and you'll be okay. But there is no such thing as a second-class citizen in the kingdom of God. As the old evangelical refrain said, God has no grandchildren. Uh, that's right. <laughs> it's as we are called into being starting from where we are that we find ourselves turned into sons, daughters of God, insiders in the kingdom. And exactly the same is true of us as it is of everyone else. By your fruits shall you know them. In other words, we pick up from other people whether they know themselves as loved and are therefore able to live on the inside of the life of the spirit. As we start to pick that up, we begin to say, yes, we honor you for being who you are. We don't need to be ashamed of you. You who have dwelt in shame need no longer be ashamed. You who've learned how to sit with your shame are being brought into being as something glorious, as, as someone married by God. This is the, the promise, remember, of, uh, uh, of the gospel, which is the fulfillment of what's promised in Isaiah. You who are called abandoned, you who are called desolate, will be called married because God is in you. So this is, if you like, what for me is the the work that's present for us in the church, not minding too much about those who insist on trying to gaslight us because it suits them, because they're so frightened. But instead saying, damn it, I'm not going to be frightened of living in a place of shame. I'm going to wait for the regard of God to look at me and say, you are. That, it seems to me, is what uh, what this is about. This is about uh, being called into being as sons and daughters of God. That's the, the general outline of what I wanted to, to, to set with you. And of course, it, it follows on very much from what you said in your introduction. That the more we're discovering that what we are is bearers of a non-pathological minority variant in the human condition, the more it becomes clear that who we are to be flows from whom we are, uh, not has to be arrived at despite who we are. Psychologically, there is so much difference between become someone despite who you are and become someone starting from whom you are. This is, uh, this is the sign, if you like, of the creator bringing us into being. Anyhow, that's where I wanted just to start with you because I didn't want to go on too much at you without first having heard where you are and how I might be helpful to you. So if we can, if I can turn back to the host, uh, Callum, uh, are you controlling questions, comments, or is someone controlling questions and comments? Yes, we are. We have Callum controlling the comments. Thank you, James. 
for what you said. It's it's so true. I mean, I have such admiration and love for gay people. I really feel you're so brave. I've never once had to stand up and say, hi, I'm Kate and I'm straight. You know, it's <laughs> having to announce your sexuality isn't something that people have to do. And of course it shouldn't. You are who you are and we all are. We're all children of God. And I loved what Tina Beatty said earlier when we spoke to her and she was saying to us about baptism that no distinction is made. You know, we're welcomed into the church as brother, sister, slave, free, you know, there is no distinction. We're all equal. And, um, and I hang on to that, you know, I think for people who are hanging on by their fingertips and during our journey of discernment, we, you know, it became clear that people were finding it very difficult to be part of our church, especially young people today. I know with my own sons and daughters who are so switched on when it comes to equality and hugely supportive, they see no distinction. And that is hugely encouraging, I, I think, you know, for all of us. Yes. Um, I think and Yes, please go on. Yeah, I think, I think that's absolutely right. I, I think that the nobility of young people who have realized that this is a gospel issue, yeah. even if they don't use that language, absolutely um, puts our church leadership to shame. Mm -hmm. Secondary school kids are able to stand up and tell the truth in this area, where bishops and trained theologians are quite unable to dare to say a word. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's abundantly clear. Um, uh, I don't know if Callum is ready to um, to start hitting the chat function. Um, I'm sure there are questions there already. Indeed, we've got we've got one question in uh, so far, but please do continue to to add your questions to the the chat function, which, as I said earlier, you'll find at the bottom of your screen, or you'll find uh, if you click more at the bottom of your screen from an iPad. Uh, tablet device or phone. But our first question, James, uh, simply asks, uh, thank you, first of all, it says, and it says, do you think that LGBT men are more acceptable, quote unquote, in the church today than LGBT women? Um, well, I think uh, there's a different, uh, it really depends on the, on the perception. Um, there's one sense in which women being women are just much more threatening to the whole of the clerical establishment altogether, as um, uh, Tina told you about, and I think very well, but it's something the system just doesn't know how to cope with. Um, having said that, uh, I think that gay men who are honest and open are in some sense much more frightening close up and personal to the clerical establishment because so many of the clerical establishment are closeted gay men. Uh, in other words, the issue there is not <laughs> whether they're gay or not, but how open uh, they are about it. And of course, openness in this sphere causes a great deal of pain and anguish to those who have remained closed. Um, I'm afraid that's it. That's part of the reality of, of the, where the church is uh, at the moment. I think it's a reality that it's a shifting, it's a shifting reality that has shifted enormously over the last 60, 70, 80 years. Um, and it's now gradually shifting into a space where I think that as it becomes visible and as the shame issue diminishes, eventually it will cease to be so frightening uh, for so many, so many senior clergy persons. You. Helen says many thanks for what you said. Can you give us your views, please, on the, the scriptural references which are used so often to justify negative attitudes towards LGBT people in the church? Do you feel the wrong well, interpretation? Oh well, uh, yeah, but that would take it would take a long time. Um, I would very I'd be very happy to do that, but I think we would need a special 
session dedicated specifically to that issue. Um, uh, one of the, th I mean, you know, very, very briefly in a nutshell, um, there are two major texts that are used in this area um, from the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, one, as you all know, is the story of, of Sodom. Um, and uh, this was interpreted, uh, it's actually interpreted in scripture as to do with mistreatment of foreigners and not uh, bad treatment of the poor, bad treatment of visitors. That's what the prophet Ezekiel says. It's only uh, from the time of uh, Philo of Alexandria onwards that it starts to be interpreted in the anti-gay uh, way. Um, so not even during Christ's lifetime uh, and Jesus' own interpretation uh, of it, the references he makes to it is always to do with rejecting messengers who come from God, which is what the original story is about. So you don't need to be um, a brilliant exegete to realize that the threat, if that's what it was, of uh, humiliating male rape as an act of grotesque inhospitality is, has as much to do with homosexuality as the threat of grotesque heterosexual rape uh, in the similar story in the book of Judges about the, the, the um, Levite and his uh, concubine uh, has to do with heterosexuality. Uh, <laughs> uh, the threat and actual practice of any form of violent uh, uh, rape is obviously an abomination, full stop. I think more need to be said about that. Then there's the passage in Leviticus about what, which um, uh, is so much ink has been spilt. That I, that I have a feeling that we're getting to the place where we, we do have a clearer idea of what it means, but even so, it will not be resolved. But here's the first thing about that text in the book of Leviticus, which is important for any Christian who was not born Jewish, any Gentile Christian to understand. It is part of the holiness code of the book of Leviticus, which was abrogated by St. Peter on the instruction of the Holy Spirit for Gentiles. There would be no baptized Gentiles if the holiness code had not been abrogated. It was when St. Peter saw the vision of all the forbidden foods coming down to him in a sheet and he was told take and eat and he said no three times thus rejecting uh, the offer of eating with impure people realized that that was the same refusal that he'd made when he uh, denied Jesus three times and then he went to visit the house of the Gentiles and realize that they were insiders in the same thing as he, the Holy Spirit had come down upon them. He then said, God has shown me to call no human profane or unclean. In other words, the whole of Gentile Christianity and probably uh, much of Jewish Christianity as well is already undergoing the huge change of learning that it's not what the purity code says, it's what we learn to be true about what the humans are, that is going to be how we learn to behave and what is good and what is holy in God's sight. So the first point about the Leviticus thing is it's been abrogated. The second point is no one knows exactly what it meant in let us say 500 BC. The earliest interpretations that we have of it come again uh, from the time of, of uh, Philo, uh, who was a Jewish uh, philosopher in Alexandria who read it in Greek. Um, and he interpreted it in ways that suggest uh, that he thought it was somehow linked to what was understood at the time to be eunuchs. He treated it in a separate category of special, special Jewish laws, nothing central, just um, special Jewish laws by which Moses showed that he didn't like that sort of person around here. However, the most recent um, studies have pointed out that actually we can be pretty clear what the phrase doesn't mean because there's a perfectly good phrase in Hebrew for thou shalt not lie 
with a male with a male. And this is not it. If what the author of the book of Leviticus had wanted to say was, thou shalt not have gay sex <laughs> uh, between males, because it's only talking about males. Um, that is not how you say it in Hebrew. Classical Hebrew has a perfectly simple way of saying that, and this is not it. It says, you will not lie. The lyings of males with a certain sort of female, lyings of males with a woman, that's a very specific uh, qualification of the that shall not lie with. And given the list of previous um, previous people it's forbidden to lie with in both the occasions where this text comes up, it's, it seems as likely as not that effectively the phrase is saying, uh, thou shalt not lie with a male according to all that other list of things concerning lyings with women. Because the list had said, you shall not lie with your father's wife. You shall not lie with your father's concubine. You shall not lie with your um, um, uncle's wife. In other words, it gives a whole lot list of female kin with whom you may not lie. And it's as sensible a suggestion as any and I, as I said, the interest is purely academic if you're a Gentile Christian, <laughs> but it's as sensible a reading as any uh, to say, well, almost certainly this means don't lie with any of the male equivalents of the female whom it is forbidden, forbidden to lie. In other words, no close kin, uh, uh, yeah, exactly the, as the, the list of prohibited uh, people who you should not, who would you were not married because they're too they're too close. No one closer than your second cousin or third cousin or whatever the uh, I don't know what the law is in Scotland or in England anymore as regards uh, marriage uh, con consanguine marriage. But that's the kind of thing that they were interested in. Um, we could go through the the New Testament text, but again, that would take a a, a longish time. I think you're right. Key... We could spend we could we could spend a, a long time on on those questions and and the full of the scriptures. Thank you very much for a very very full answer. Uh, within the time, the questions are coming in thick and fast. So if you don't mind, uh, I'll put okay. it on to you. I will turn my I will turn my attention to whatever it is that you would like to have. Uh... Kevin asks, where do we go with the the hypocrisy in the church that still can so easily condemn the LGBT community? But yet we know so many of their priests are gay. Should more yeah. priests not be coming out and opening up to the debate? Yes, and more um, more Republican senators ought to have voted to impeach President Trump. We know that people are run by the systems that they think they're running. Uh, it's a terrible sacred trap, I'm afraid. The, the clerical closet. Uh, there is real fear that you'll lose everything um, if you come out of it. But but here's here's the here's the thing. This is something which historically is moving. What's happened over the last fifty years is that what used to be the safest place within most of our civil societies for being gay and not being questioned, no questions asked as to why. You were unmarried or didn't want to be married. Um, no uh, particular questions about your personal emotional uh, life and a good deal of tolerance for, um, let's say, uh, liturgical display. Um, this was the safest place at a time when most of our civil societies were dangerous, where uh, murder, blackmail, suicide, etc., etc., were very much the norm. So uh, there was a time, if you like, in a particularly cruel society where the church was the least cruel place. Curiously, over the last uh, 50 years, that has shifted, or rather the society has gradually learnt what is true in this area and started to act accordingly. And the result of that, without the church actually doing anything in particular, except holding on to its so-called safe space, um, is that what was a friendly don't ask, don't tell has become a, an obligatory don't ask, don't tell. And of course, a friendly don't ask, don't tell is a kind of a bland hypocrisy. 
an enforced don't ask, don't tell is a very cruel uh, hypocrisy because it traps people. It makes people unable to be, to live freely and faithfully and honestly. But what's also happening, thank heavens, this has been happening more and more visibly over the last 30 years, is that as people start to come out younger and younger and get used to the fact that there are other people around about whom they know, who are able to talk about this. So uh, the, if you like, the just visibility of the normalness makes it actually very difficult, even for the clergy to be able to run away from people perceiving who they are. If it looks like a duck, and it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, then it's probably a duck. In the old days, you could say it looks like a duck, it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, it must be a priest. Um, I think that those days, those days are changing. Um, and with that, the need to find ways of learning to be more honest are developing. I don't think that any desire to try to, inf to force people out of the sake because it's going to work. It's a terribly cruel reality and only grace can bring them out of it. Only grace and only us being graceful towards our trapped brothers uh, uh, can work in this sphere. Why do I say this? I think that it's important. I, the image which I have of the clerical closet is the image of an iceberg. And it's important to think of it as an iceberg for this reason. An iceberg is simply frozen water. It's there. It's dangerous for shipping. Uh, we have to know about it. We have to understand that it's there so as to be able to avoid it. But we also need to be aware that it's melting, that it's gradually turning into water, like the water that the rest of us are in. We need to take care not to run into it, certainly not obsessionally trying to sort it out, feeling that we need to break the iceberg by charging into it. That will only do us harm, or won't do the iceberg much harm. We also need to be aware that a great deal more of it is invisible than is visible. It's true of all icebergs. And we need to be able to keep our eye on our final destiny uh, and not get too distracted by avoiding icebergs. Keep going, take small detours, but be aware that this is a, a diminishing reality. I think that by not being too obsessed by it or angry with it or resentful about it, we keep ourselves on track and we help it melt. That's the, that's the image I, I, I have of the, uh, the clerical closet and what to do about it. Thank you. I wonder if I can put two questions on a, a similar theme to you now. Um, the first asks, how much impact do you feel that Pope Francis's recent and indeed not so recent statements have made to an open conversation? And on a, a similar vein, uh, someone comments, I read, I read an article that suggested that Pope Francis was taken out of context, which suggests that the church is now kind of rowing back on the statement made about gay relationships. So could you comment, first of all, on whether Francis's comments open the conversation? And secondly, whether you feel it's now trying to, to roll back on that comment? Um, well, first, first of all, Francis is normally very good at um, these little signs, these little nudges, these little gestures, which are not in themselves doctrinal statements, but open up the way for things to be talked about and things to be treated um, more reasonably and gently by people. And he's been terribly good at that so far. As far as I can tell, uh, what happened on the latest uh, uh, statement, first of all, what, the one that came out concerning the uh, Francesco, the, the documentary, was a massive uh, Vatican Communications snafu. <laughs> um, apparently, uh, they were told by people who knew that this was coming out, this will be an issue. I said, oh, no, it won't, no, it'll just, it'll just go away. It won't be a real issue. In other words, they were warned 
and they didn't do anything to prepare uh, for it. So the documentary was made with a compilation of, uh, of, of film from their own archives, um, which the filmmaker was given access to. And frankly, they didn't do a great job in terms of preparing it. The result was that we got what I think is best described as an impromptu Francis nudge that Francis wasn't actually personally responsible for, in the sense that he was saying what he was saying in the context of those uh, interviews of which we got uh, edited versions. And it came across as a um, one of his nudges. I think that the uh, the subsequent document trying to put things right is basically try to uh, unfrighten bishops. Uh, I think that the effect uh, of all of us was of of one of his of one of his nudges, and it was a nudge which had the effect I think of spreading mostly relief, a sense that we are going to be able to deal with this issue. It is going to be able to be dealt, dealt with reasonably. It's not a hellish fight between people who are struggling with a sacred war in order to oppress uh, people we know and love and are beginning to see are like us. Uh, that, it seems to me, that that's, that's the way I, I take it. As always with the Vatican, expect communicational snafus and whatever ball they give you, take it and run. That's my, uh, that's my, uh, my take. Thank you very much. The next question, um, the next question I think will be a, a, a it's a very striking one certainly, it's, it's coming to me privately rather than in the, the public chat here. And it simply says, as a member of the clergy who is gay and who works with young people, and who wants to be much more open, but is afraid to be because of feared consequence, what can you say to encourage me? God love you. Um, I think that one of the things is you need to get your line of authority open so that you can be open. You need to begin to reach out to those who hold the word of approval over you to see whether some kind of honesty and transparency is possible. That's going to be uh, the difficult thing. Uh, it's as you begin to be able to talk about these things with the people whom you fear might say no. So that's the thing, as I said, the key question is approval. First of all, the time silently in your, uh, in your pantry, in your larder, in your closet, uh, learning to let go of the approval that comes from the Pharisees who get their approval by saying things in the market square and learning how to receive your approval from your father who knows all things and knows what you need and will teach you how to ask for it. And as you get that, starting to uh, look at your line of approval and see whether someone can be talked to so that you feel freer to be able to represent love to those you love. Thank you, James. On a, a similar vein, Mia also asks, can you offer any advice to parishioners who also want to help priests in this situation? Uh, yeah, don't frighten them. Uh, let them know you know, let them know that it's not an issue. Um, I think that there are ways of there are wonderful ways of doing that. I mean, I remember, I remember a story uh, which I learned from a, a friend of mine in a parish in uh, uh, in Miami, um, uh, Miami, Florida, uh, Cuban parish, Cuban American parish, mostly Spanish speaking, 
uh, the parish priest um, uh, had an Anglo boyfriend, uh, an Anglo guy from Texas who would hang around the parish, was very helpful with new music and things like that, was much loved and appreciated. Um, it was effectively uh, the partner of the, of the parish priest. And the parish was run by Cuban ladies of a certain, a certain age and with a certain rather conservative background because uh, that's, you know, these were the anti-castrist, anti-castrist uh, Cubans. And the leader of the Blue Rinse Brigade uh, came, to, came to see him and said, uh, Father, I want to have a word with you. So he said, no, fine, yep. and I had a word. And then she said, it's about Andrew. And of course he, he froze. I uh, didn't know what to do and what to expect. And she said to him, the ladies and I have been talking. Um, please don't go away to be with Andrew. We like Andrew here very much. And that was it. That was what she said. <laughs> and I thought to myself, my God, if uh, <laughs> the sheer good sense of someone who understood why their parish was uh, healthy and why things were working well. Uh, that was a breath of grace. How many, how many of us priests have longed to hear that breath of grace? Uh, I think also a key thing is not just with the priests, but it's with the young people insisting that this is a, any parish that has a passion for family learning how to cope with the diversity of family and how to be prepared for uh, and with hand out stretched towards that seems to be to be a, uh, an apostolate for all i uh, sorry i hope that isn't too vague fantastic thank you very much Hugh asks, should a congregation actually be interested in whether their celibate priest is homosexual or heterosexual? Is it important for some or many priests that their orientation should be known to their congregations? So two questions there. Yeah. Um, when people uh, are transparent, it doesn't matter. When they're not transparent, it matters. For the moment, it's very, very difficult for the gay priests to be transparent. If they tell personal uh, narratives, they have to change the gender of the person uh, with whom they uh, had a love affair or whatever. Uh, stories have to be changed. transparency, the ability to be able to share from the heart seems to me to be part of why somebody might want to be single-hearted. Uh, to be single-hearted and yet have to be double-hearted. Mm. Not wonderful. So this is not a question of saying someone must be out. But if people are not able to be who they are wholeheartedly as preachers of the gospel, People pick up, people pick up uh, the vibes. Not the words, but the vibes. I think that's, that's, that's at least as, as an enormous part of my, my experience, uh, um, being with people. Thank you. Rosa asks, why has the church, do you think, been so obsessed with sex and sexuality for so long? Ah. I mean, I suspect that it's become more, um, more apparently focused on this as they have lost the ability to have a major say in the wider political and financial areas of people's lives. If you like, it became the last area in which uh, people could be shamed and therefore controlled, the intimate sphere. 
And I think that it became particularly complicated starting from the end of the 19th century when all that was previously unspeakable started to become talkable. Let's remember that the church, the, the fundamentals of church teaching as it stands now is from the second century uh, before Christ and reached its maximum expression, if you like, in the 13th century. Uh, it gives, uh, if you like, an overall ideal picture of what human married life and sex should be at a time when there was no particular expectation that that's what people really lived. It was understood that that was ideal. And in that kind of world, the relationship between the merciful, being merciful to the reality with which people live and the, uh, if you like, the so-called objective view of where things should be was something that the people shared. It was less shameful if everybody shared. What you've started having happening, I think, as I say, particularly during the course of the 19th and early 20th century, way into our times, is that all of that world was basically a don't ask, don't tell. There were marriage, there were things that were formerly good, and there was a huge amount of don't ask, don't tell. And what we've had since the beginning of psychology really <laughs> talking therapy freud and the whole world that developed after that is that these things have started to become talkable and i think that that is the problem uh, for the church the, the problem for the church curiously is not sex it's its language once people start to be able to talk about these things honestly it means that the gap between the ideal sphere and the messy reality starts to be undone at the moment they have no ability to cope with the gap between the ideal sphere and the messy reality and us learning how to talk through that in ways that become holy and point the ways to holiness is how we have to take this forward that's that's my sense of that of an answer to, to that question thank you and just a reminder, please do continue to, to add your questions. It's great to see some of them still coming in. Please do continue to post them into the chat area. Um, our next question begins by thanking you for that, that first response, that commentary on scriptural references, and asks, is there a, a book or an article, perhaps by you or by, by another, that walks people through these and other scriptural you know, scriptural references that were typically used and are typically used to support Christian anti-homosexuality? Actually, there's a very good little book um, written for a general audience by a, a, a man called Daniel Helminiak, H-E-L-M-I-N-I-A-K. And it's called What the Bible Really Says About Homosexuality. And uh, it does what it says on the can. Um, it is quite literally that. The, uh, as far as I know, it, there, was a, there was a a new edition of it in about 2000 or 2001, but as far as I know, it's still available. There was a huge amount of writing on, on the subject, uh, but that's a particularly good uh, little, um, uh, little guide. There's a more recent stuff, which is very, very good by... Uh, a Danish exegete called Renato Links, who writes in English. And I think that, uh, that his book is called Love Lost in Translation. And it's a very detailed examination of how all our English language Bibles have regularly mistranslated the words uh, which we are used to hearing us to do with homosexuality. And it's fascinating because he is a, a real philologist and he really knows his ancient Hebrew and his ancient Greek words. Um, so there is literature out there. I've I've done you know, I've done a series of uh, videos on on those, but actually in Spanish. So I'm afraid I can't uh, be of much use. I hope I hope to do them in English sometime if I can get someone to record me. Um, but one of the things that I think is becoming clear is that we can let go of our fear that they might say something awful about us they don't. The word homosexuality was invented in German in 1869. 
when it was invented, it was the first time it was invented in order to describe a certain sort of person, not a certain sort of behavior, a certain sort of person, the realization that there was a sort of person. It was considered clinical at the time. It was an attempt to describe a certain sort of person. Our words, gay or lesbian, if you like, are happier versions of that, less clinical versions of that, as we've come to understand that we are simply something that just is. Now, the ancient world had no such way of referring to such people. The reality, of course, was there, but not the appreciation of it in that way. So any attempt to prove that homosexuality is referred to in the Bible is off to a false start. The ancient realities that are being described, like, for instance, uh, raping someone's messengers as a way of humiliating uh, their host or their, uh, the person who sent them, that is part of an ancient world doing things which we would quite rightly regard as abominable, and they were meant to be abominable. They were a sign. They were the, the equivalent of fuck you to the, the person who was responsible. So the threat to Lot's guests was a fuck you to Lot. Uh, that, was, that was how that worked. That's a form, of, a form of extremely violent, unpleasant symbolism. And so on, and so on, and so on. This is a reality that has always been dealt with in strange, don't ask, don't tell ways. And we're now reaching the stage where, thank heavens, we can begin to work out for ourselves things that are genuinely abominable, like rape of that sort, and things that are not. And from a Catholic perspective, it's well worth remembering that the most authoritative document we have on this issue is the Pontifical Biblical Commission's document of 1993 on how to read the New Testament, which is particularly keen on avoiding the fundamentalist reading. It says you should not transfer straight into modern categories, ancient and varied categories. That's fundamentalism. It's specifically disapproved of in the church's own teaching on how to read scripture. For Catholics, it's much easier. We can heave a sigh of relief and say, Thank God, we're not obliged to read those texts in a fundamentalist way. For Protestants, it's more difficult. They have to learn that for themselves. But uh, let's be grateful for a, a, good, a good piece of papal teaching. That document from the Pontifical Biblical Commission, signed by Joseph Ratzinger and approved by John Paul II. Thank you. Um, I'm sure you'll forgive me, but can I ask you to repeat the name of the, the first author? Yes, Daniel Helminiak, H-E-L-M-I-N-I-A-K. Thank you very much. Our next question from Des asks, what does the church need to do now to reach out to the present LGBT community to counteract the received message that they were second class citizens? Well, I would say what to the church, what, what, what are we doing? Well, I hope that you're um, just socializing, learning from your LGBT uh, contemporaries, what it might look like to create friendship. What does it look like to become friends with each other? It's going to look like something which if you like, uh, it's complicated, but let's, let's think about it. What, what happens when two straight people get married? One of the things in the old, I don't know whether this is true in Scotland, but in the old English common book, book of common prayer, one of the things says, with my body, I the worship. I don't, I don't know whether that uh, was the case in, in, in the Scottish prayer book but in the English common book of prayer for the Anglican church with the body, I the worship. And of course that comes from the old Anglo-Saxon, worth-ship, it's, it's honor. The notion that what the couple are doing with their bodies is honoring each other, 
honoring each other in places where there might have been potential shame, the places which are referred to as the shameful parts were being honored. I think that one of the things which we appreciate and one of the things which we are going to learn is how do our same-sex oriented friends in couples honor each other and how are we going to be wearing witness to their honoring each other and how are we going to be helping each other cover our nakedness with glory that's part of what the gospel offers someone who was prepared to dwell in the place of shame so that we may not, might no longer be run by shame i think uh, that if you like one of the wonderful things which our generation uh, is going to have fairly soon as i say is the first generation of young people for whom uh, gay and lesbian young people for whom the possibility of being married always existed it was never an impossibility or something that was in doubt it's just there so they will have approached it with a non-terrified uh, angle as a dream that could always be fulfilled these are the people who are going to show us what the shape of this kind of coupling is what kind of blessing it is amongst us and how we are to be grateful for and receive this blessing amongst us so i, th I think that we have a lot of work to do in helping uh, read the sign what is what is what's the queer in the sign that god is creating the sign of god's love and god's goodness in our midst thank you um, James, the next question asks, do you believe that the, the institution of the church, the institution itself, can ever get itself out of the moral impasse that it's in, in terms of human sexuality? Yes, I think it is. Um, I think that uh, it's getting there very, very slowly. Um, remember, Humanae Vitae, 50 years ago, 52 years ago now, huge huge problems amoris laetitiae effectively puts that to bed once uh, the same teaching applying to straight couples just to gay couples which is that no sexual act uh, where the unitive and the prerogative are separated uh, can be legitimate once that is undone as has effectively now been undone in terms of the non-reception of humanae vitae and it being made perfectly clear that it's a question of uh, of conscience it's only a question of time before it becomes equally clear that the non-procurative but unitive forms of uh, sexual relationship may after all have uh, a value of bonding that creates kinship and is able to give glory. That's a question of time. It's a question of allowing bishops to cease being so frightened of their world collapsing. Uh, it's not going to happen in a hurry, but it's always a question of me. By their fruit, you shall know them. By their fruit, you shall know them. Reproduce the fruit. And eventually it will be there. Thank you. The next question asks, are you in favour of special masses for LGBT that are appearing in some dioceses? Um, yes, I am. Not because I think ultimately uh, and in the end it's necessary, but because for the moment uh, the presence of such masses is a sign, the beginnings of a sign of penitence by church authority for having so grotesquely mishandled the message of the gospel with relation to gay and lesbian people. Because it it's, uh, means that people are able to come together and be themselves in the presence of our Lord around the altar so that we can be blessed by his presence and we can become him 
together without being ashamed. And I think that as a sign, the beginnings of a sign, that's tremendously important. I think the people who have been told you are not, are not in the same category as for instance, a recent immigrant group. Some people say, oh, it's like having a, a special mass for Polish people or a special mass for um, some new immigrant uh, immigrant group. And really they ought to be integrated and assimilated. Uh, being Polish has never been regarded as a hell matter. So telling Polish people to become integrated into their greater church is a slightly different matter from beginning to become aware that you have been creating a hell matter rather than presenting the gospel to people. So yes, I'm in favor of uh, there being a chance for uh, gay people to take part, to have uh, masses in which they can be who they are with other people like themselves without it being an issue as part of getting ready for being able to be signs that uh, this is not a hell issue. Thank you. Um, a quick one on this, we're being asked again, could you remind us the name of the, the document from the Pontifical Biblical Commission that you referenced there? Oh, um, I think it's called the Interpretation of the New Testament or the Church's Interpretation of the New Testament. Um, it's from 1993. Thank you. And if I could ask you to respond to a, a comment, please. David says that no, rep, no recognition that LGBTQ folk exist in a, in a diocese, never mentioned by the official church. Um, this invisibility, uh, which, which we see in diocese and is reflected in parishes, which seems quite odd. Could you perhaps comment on that idea? Well, um, yeah create the human visibility you know you've got you've, you've got a frightened bunch of guys um who's your most famous uh gay catholic in scotland probably cardinal o'brien and what a tragic story a person who when he was archbishop of edinburgh as far as i understand it was pretty open in this sphere, was very good at the time of AIDS, very good uh, in terms of pastoral for suffering from uh, people with AIDS. At a meeting I attended in, I think, 2000 in Edinburgh, he appointed a, a, a local priest to be his chaplain to this uh, LGCM meeting. He was friendly, he was warm. He became a cardinal and something happened. <sighs> This is clearly a world of great fear and panic for these guys, where visibility is terribly difficult for them. So it's, it's by our socialization that we have to create the visibility. What is going on in such and such a diocese, in the physical space? Remember that the church is for the world. <laughs> our apostolate is trying to enable those places to become alive to the gospel. How are we doing that? What kind of outreach are we having to people in those places? What links it may have or may not have with the official life of uh, parishes or dioceses? Uh, that will come with time as they lose fear. If we are not frightened, we will not frighten them. If we are frightened, they will be even more frightened. Thank you. James, a question has come in which says, uh, you've been given back the, the power of the keys. What has that meant for you in reality? It meant, it's meant that I'm not, I mean, it's had a huge psychological impact on me. And my friends have noticed this, uh, uh, that I've um, just become much braver and less less uh, tentative in, 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 in what I say. Um, and, and do, I'm no longer worried that I might be uh, 
I might be doing something risky when celebrating masses for people in strange places. I didn't think I was, uh, but now I know I'm not. Um, preaching, likewise. Hearing confessions, likewise. Well, that doesn't happen all that often, but it does happen. But just the sense that it has been possible. It's become possible to receive the gospel, to grow in the gospel as a gay man and as a priest. This is a possible vocation. It's not an impossible vocation. By the skin of my teeth, I mean, not through any marriage of my own. Um, and this is going to be more possible in future. This is not a dead end uh, thing. So yes, I, I, I've been hugely personally uh, affected by it, um, both you know, technically and a sense of my God, I went through all that and it was worth it. It was worth it. I've now more of a priest, not less. Uh, thanks to this, better prepared to preach the gospel. So yes, no, it was a, an extraordinary, it was one of those those nudges, <laughs> uh, which I described, which uh, on juridical, you know, on juridical paper, not much, in real, psychologically, woof, uh, everything. <laughs> Great, thank you, James. A question earlier, and, and apologies, I've just noticed that from Agatha referring to your story earlier about Andrew, um, and she asks, do you think it would have been the same if Andrew were Agnes? Interesting. Um, I think probably not. This is one of the strange, mysterious things about uh, her um, clerical life. Only if the priest is very obviously gay and comparatively relaxed with himself are people unworried if there are Agnes's in his life. <laughs> because it's clear that uh, lots of gay men have very good women friends. <laughs> um, and there is no complications uh, uh, there. But I think that you're absolutely uh, right. Um, people are anxious if uh, the uh, the parish priest has a close uh, woman friend because the possibility of marriage and therefore of children uh, starts to become real. There is something bizarrely invisible about same-sex relationships. Uh, uh, but I think you're right. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I think that the... Um, I suspect that the uh, the blue rinse lady would have taken Agnes to one side and given her a talking to. Thank you. Rab asks, have you ever been tempted to shake the dust from your feet and simply to leave the institutional church? No. No, I, I, uh, my conversion experience to, to the Catholic faith uh, when I was 18 was so uh, overwhelming and overpowering, such a complete love um, that uh, I've known that, 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 that this, this, is, this, is, this is for life. This is, the, uh, yeah, no, there was no, there was no, there was no way out after this. I was given the gift of the Catholic faith. That there's a, a, such an extraordinary gift um, that uh, I've, 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 whoever I am to be, it's inside this. Thank you. If I can share another comment with you uh, from Sally, who says, as a mum, I'd just like to say a, a big thank you. It was really great to be able to tell my children that I was coming to this tonight invite them along if they wanted to. I find it so hard that we as parents bring them up for, uh, you know, for this not to, to be an issue, what sexuality that they are, but yet they know that the church teaches differently. 
Some of their friends even left their Catholic school because of it. And this is the toughest issue for her trying to raise children in the church. I wonder if you might comment on that, James. I think you're right. I think that uh, this is a gospel issue. People uh, will leave dying institutions because of their inability to be truthful in this sphere. And you are bearing witness to the pain of holding on to the faith and keeping it alive to what is true in the gospel. And I think that that's, you know, that's, part of, uh, that's part of what we're going through. We're being ground through the mill at this time, learning how to be truthful in the midst of sacred seeming resistance. Thank you. And uh, another testimony. The, the church does not always feel a safe place for those of us who are lay and gay, this comment says. I'm careful about what I disclose about my identity in my parish and to whom I edit my personal story. I'm never untrue in what I say, just careful. But if challenged, I'm open about myself. I can do this now that I'm retired from my job, which had been in a church agency where most colleagues were accepting, but in public, I had to be careful. And I wonder again if you might comment on that. Yeah, it, 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 you're right. This is, this is how it is, Gra gradually being able to become transparent over time. And the, the real issues of security and well-being of others, not only ourselves, that we have to take into account in doing these things. So, so thank you. Thank you for your witness. The next question um, that I want to take came in slightly earlier uh, and it asked about, you know, the LGBT hate crime and how that has been covered by, by international law, but perhaps what the, where the church's voice should be on that matter and why, where the church should be speaking much more courageously and openly on an international scale. Yes, I know that one of the, the first things that most people, obviously including myself, want is for uh, uh, some kind of church commitment to de decriminalization uh, because that's obviously an issue in many countries, particularly in African countries, and obviously a lot of Muslim majority countries where the Catholic Church has no real voice. But there are a number of uh, Christian countries where the Catholic, the presence, Catholic presence is significant, where a firm stand uh, against criminalization, such as can be given. I mean, the Cardinal of Bombay uh, was very bold on this. In other words, it's not impossible. Um, but if you like, uh, I wish it would be more, um, more universal. Now, one thing I've learned, having said that, you know, in my naivete, uh, as I, uh, you know, in the early 2000s, as I was trying to think, more and more on my way into the kind of ministry uh, in which I am now, the more it seems to me, well, once the church has got the basic definition right, then of course it needs to um, apply uh, the same definition across the board and, and that will be the same in all countries. After all, it tries to do that with its awful translations of the liturgy, comes up with a dreadful mistranslation of the liturgy and then forces it on everybody. Why can't it do the same <laughs> in this sense? But that was naive, because what I've learned is that actually every culture, every country, every language group has got, let's say, a, a different history of the demonization of this area. It's a different mixture of possession, evil spirit, the level, the, the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod, the religious, the political, the social, the animist. This is different in each country. The way in which we cover up, lie, etc., etc., is different in each country. And it's as is the cultural difference of the of the demonized state. So is the incarnation, incarnational presence of Christ's exorcism. In other words, it's only as 
Christ is able to come alive incarnate in each one of those cultures and exorcise those demons, that we're actually able to stand up and have the legal uh, and religious, not only freedom, but, but splendor that is proper to us, we're able to be clothed, seated and in our right mind, as opposed to the demonized person who was struggle beating himself up. Um, the gatherings. So, yeah, I long for the international uh, church to be having an international response, but I'm aware that on this issue, it's local incarnation that is going to lead to Christ to exercise these demons. So that's the, uh, I hope that's a, a beginning of an answer to the, the question that was asked. Thank you. The next question says, recently we've seen growing examples of apostolates being encouraged for LGBT Catholics who seem to promote or argue that a celibate life is the quote unquote solution. What would you say to this? I mean, I take you're referring to, to courage, um, uh, which, uh, which as far as I know is uh, um, uh, a Catholic apostolate that is dedicated to promoting celibacy amongst uh, gay people. Um, I think it's perfectly splendid that there should be a, a, a Catholic uh, uh, apostolate to help those gay people who have a vocation to celibacy to be celibate. Uh, in the old days, they would have joined a monastery. Uh, now, uh, there may be Catholic gay people who will find themselves called to celibate lives and who wish, uh, you know, to socialize that, to live that. The difficulty is when this is given as the only way you can be a good Catholic. In other words, you've got to be celibate because you're gay. Uh, that's not how the New Testament describes celibacy at all. If people are forced to be celibate, and then told that that's the only thing they can be, then fairly soon, and this I'm afraid is what happens in many of these apostolates, either it becomes clear to them as they begin to become socialized that what they are is actually quite natural and not something bad, in which case the question comes, well, why should they be celibate? I haven't actually chosen to be celibate, you've merely told me that I've got to be. In which case the answer is, oh, but you can't be because you're not really who you think you are. You need to be healed from your same sex attraction. In other words, very, very quickly, if you have involuntary celibates and you want to insist that they must be involuntary and they must be celibate and keep uh, that involuntary, the tendency is to tip over into, therefore you must go into some form of, uh, healing to be cured of your same-sex attraction. I think that's been the difficulty with the apostolates that uh, say that they're just to help gay people who want to be celibate, but basically you're saying, actually, if you're gay and Catholic, you've got to be celibate, there is no option. And if you think that you might actually just be an ordinary person and therefore might have the option of choosing between being celibate and not celibate, no, you're wrong. The church says you're wrong, uh, but you can be cured. It's a slippery path because it's heading towards a, a psychologically damaging and as far as we can tell, simply mendacious uh, form of approach to who people are. So uh, you've asked me about, about that kind of possibility. I'd say a collection of Catholics who want to be celibate and share uh, their lives uh, in some way and help socialize uh, any difficulties they might have in being celibate, wonderful. Every diocese should have one. The claim that that's the only way of being Catholic if you're gay, and that if you're not, you're somewhere being a bad Catholic, and that other forms of apostolate should be abolished. Eh, there's something uh, defensive, and if you like, that sounds like Holy Mother Church trying to spread its closet. Thank you very much, James. I'm, I'm very conscious of time, so thank you very much for your uh, for your responses, and thank you to everyone who's contributed their answers, it becomes more and more challenging each time we do this to, to keep up with the incredible volume of questions that, that come in. So my apologies 
to anyone mm. who I have missed inadvertently. But uh, thank you once again to James, and I'll hand back to Kate. Thank you, James, for your honesty and and for just tackling every question put to you just so clearly and simply. Uh, my heart goes out to the priest who privately messaged Callum during our conversation. Um, you know, you mentioned Keith Patrick O'Brien. I know that, you know, in, in our parish, we've never ever been able to have a conversation about what happened, uh, you know, honestly and truthfully. So to be able to speak tonight in just such a, a grown up way, uh, you know, to talk about our gay friends and fellow parishioners and priests is so refreshing. Uh, and to borrow your own line, you really are a breath of grace. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. My honour. Thank you very much indeed for, for having me. We'd like to just say a, a prayer for you now, please. Uh, as we close. Loving God, we thank you for the gift and witness of James. We thank you for what he has shared with us tonight. We ask that you anoint him and you with your spirit, such that your life may be deepened within him. We pray for all of us gathered here tonight, may have the wisdom to see the face of Jesus in the face of all those we meet, the courage to do what is right and the discernment to know what you call us to do. Bless us with the grace to thirst and hunger for justice and grant us the gifts of patience, wisdom and perseverance. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our saviour and companion on our journey. Amen. And before we finally conclude this evening, there is a follow up to what we've been talking about this evening. Uh, and I'd like to invite uh, Gerard Swan from Quest UK to say just a few words about what's going to be happening a week today. Uh, hi, everyone. I think uh, before I start, given the, the subject matter of this evening, I too should come out. Um, <laughs> I too have Scottish ancestry. Um, I'm a first generation uh, in child um, of Scottish immigrants to rural England in the middle of um, Northamptonshire in a small town, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, uh, called Corby. So I count, my, uh, I count myself as Scottish, really. Um, so I'm the, the chair of Quest, which is a small charity which has been around since 1973. And following a conversation with, with Rab, I've agreed to continue this conversation uh, with you next week. Um, my thoughts are that what I might do is tell you a bit, little bit of my own story um, and, and a little bit about Quest. And then really for you to have the opportunity over this next week um, and, and perhaps in response to anything that I say uh, that you may find valuable next week to, to kind of pose more questions and explore the issue um, further. Um, and you can be as, as, as brutal and as frank and direct with me as, as, as you like. Um, and you can do that either publicly in the chat or privately um, by posting the, the questions directly to Callum. Or if there's stuff you want to fire at me during the week, um, then my email is uh, chair at quest lgbti.uk um, and I'll, I'll kind of bring those to the table next week. Um, but feel free to be as, as open as you, as you want. And if I don't want to answer, I'll tell you I don't want to answer. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Look forward to be taking part. Thank you so much. And we look forward to that uh, next week. And also just before we go, to look ahead to Advent, we have a series of talks organized. Um, and I'd like to hand over very briefly to Rosa 
to tell us about it. Thanks, Kate. I will be very brief. Um, so we have decided that during Advent to focus on the, the challenges, the realities and experiences of our refugee communities and the refugee crisis over the world. Um, given that Jesus himself and his family were refugees, it seems really appropriate to be able to focus at this time on that. To that effect, we've asked um, Alison Phipps, who is uh, in, from Glasgow University. She has extensive work with refugees over many, many years, both in personal levels and wow. professional. And she is going to talk to us on the 3rd of December. On the 10th of December, we have Danny Sweeney back again with us. And he's going to talk about what Justice and Peace Scotland are doing in this area over this time of Advent particularly, but also throughout their whole programme. Um, Alison has also given us um, some contacts and we have from other places too, that on the 17th of December, we will hear from refugees themselves. Um, so we have an Eritrean refugee, Hayab, who has a first-hand experience of human trafficking and is now in Glasgow and is working in the university there, still works extensively with refugees uh, and asylum seekers. And we have Hannah Rose, who is an artist who gives voice to refugees through art. And she works particularly with Syrian refugees and has her own story herself. So as you can see, a lot going on there in November and hope in December. And I hope to see you all at that time. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. That, that brings us to the end of our evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Good night and God bless.